G'day fans and welcome back to another exciting episode of Nerdy Things from Another World. Yes, it's that podcast where we focus on sci-fi movies, TV shows and a little bit of Australian sci-fi fandom. Uh, I'm your host Dags and did you know that my co-host is just so cool that he actually made not one but three and a half fan films. Yes, it's welcome Jeff <laughs> Hey, Dags, there's nothing wrong with a half a fan film. So, you know, extend it to another one and call it the uh, special edition. Now, do you actually remember what the half fan film was? Oh, actually, the one that we made, I think you're referring to, was you came over to my house one day and I said, let's make a uh, fan film. And we pretty much sort of uh, filmed it within about uh, an hour and a half. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I remember it was... um, Involved a puppet and a fire, and that's all. Do you remember. remember what it was called? No. Oh, dude, you can't even remember the name of your own classics in uh, classics and in inverted commas. It was the old Pee Wee Monster. So there you go. That's right. Uh, very cool. But yes, Jeffra, we will have a, an episode where we do, do discuss uh, fan films because uh, clearly Jeffra and myself have actually made these in the past. But uh, yes, it's that half a fan film that is. Uh, well worth checking out. I'm saying that in inverted commas too because you no one's ever going to see it. Um, anyway, welcome to the show. It's an absolutely spectacular one tonight because we're talking about movies, as is often the case. And as always, we've got a letter of comment that has come through. So, Jeffro, uh, who has written said letter? And, of course, what did they say? Yes, well, this is a listener that we found on the internet who's written us a lovely letter, and he's a digital photographer. So we're going to be getting a letter from uh, Michael J. Pegg. So uh, Michael J. Pegg has, has, has said to us, I'd really like to know, guys, what makes a classic era movie so golden from the 1950s? That is a very interesting one. It's kind of ironic because a couple of uh, episodes ago we were talking about how the golden age of sci-fi was in the uh, in the eighties. But if you're talking about traditional golden era movies, it would probably be the nineteen fifties. And it's uh, a good question to ask as to why that era would be classed as the golden era. Um, I have my theories as to what the reason is, but uh, what do you have to say, old son? Well, I believe it's because there was a lot of uh, progression made in the movies, not only in uh, production design, but also directing and cinematography and all that. So I think for me, one of the uh, uh, the big things was the, um, the colour palette and, and the, the filming of things, because I saw a copy of uh, War of the Worlds, which was a re-release on Blu-ray, and they'd remastered it. And my goodness, the, the colours and the, the lighting and, and everything like that was was like I fell in love with the movie all over again. And other movies like This Island Earth, where use of colour and visual uh, design, they just go for it because they know that uh, uh, this is what people want to see in movies. And it's certainly uh, a light year step from what we were seeing in the 1940s. And I think this is something that hasn't been repeated since the uh, 50s. Like you watch the movies in the 60s, they go back to sort of muting the colours and and, and not making it sort of very visual. So the 50s, I believe, uh, have some great examples. So how does that work with black and white movies, though? Well, I guess with black and white, uh, it does make it harder in so much as that uh, people are looking for for colour to be able to sort of feel the expression of science fiction so i guess with the black and white ones um they have to rely on other things like in a lot of those movies we'll see things like um uh, background uh, uh, models and also things like the uh the the set design and all that but uh, certainly black and white does struggle a little bit so it's very interesting because it's a good question as to why the 50s movies were as popular as they were. And I think a lot of it really has to do with the post-World War II era um, and the sense of optimism that the, the the world had after the 1940s. And I guess once the film industry sort of uh, found its feet again in the 1950s, especially in the US, um, there was a big demand for really great family entertainment. And it's kind of interesting because it seems as if there was a big kickoff regarding 
films that, uh, and I agree with you, like you said, with the imagery and everything that looked really fantastic, but they could introduce things that were only ever written about in previously in pulp magazines and stories. So you had your flying saucers and your aliens and all your large monsters, and there seemed to be a market for it. So a lot of uh, films were produced sometimes really, really quickly and sometimes with rather poor production uh, standards, but the entertainment factor was there, even if that... Uh, people would see them and go well it was pretty corny and a bit cheesy but it kind of worked it was fun it was good for the family and it wasn't too serious and I think there's a lot to be said about that so um, the entertainment factor I think is a key uh, part as to why these things worked and going on what you said um, you'd be seeing things in movies that you'd never really seen before and I think that's actually quite important so you'd be going to a movie going oh my god I'm seeing aliens I've never seen aliens I've never seen flying saucers because Prior to the 1940s, a lot of this stuff just didn't exist. So I guess for a lot of people, it really was breaking new ground in many different ways. And for that reason, people just went back to the cinema time and time again. And particularly when we had the space race still in its very early days. So people would love to see something like Destination Moon, where it was designed to be the most realistic interpretation of what man would be like in space. And uh, even sort of lesser ones like uh, Rockship uh, XM. It was, it was feeding a, um, an appetite that we wanted to know what a space station would look like, how you would move in space, what are jetpacks, and uh, what anti-gravity is like, and, uh, and, and so many other different things that people just uh, ate up because, I mean, that was uh, what was driving our imaginations towards what eventually became, you know, sort of the uh, uh, Apollo program and the Gemini program. Actually, that's a very good point, because if I'm not mistaken, in the film, they actually had a cartoon sequence with uh, Woody Woodpecker explaining to the audience how space travel worked, because at that point, nobody knew anything about it at all. So it was just a, such a unique and new concept that I guess your audience would be sitting there going, well, what's the deal? We just got no idea how this works. So it's all just new and innovative. And I guess that uh, had a lot to do with it. So yeah, it's like almost pure escapism on that level that we even today, we don't really get because it really was beyond what people could ever possibly imagine. Um, and I think it's interesting to note too, that especially in the movies where um, aliens invade the earth and with the exception of day, the earth stood still, most of the time aliens invaded the earth. And, of course, they're always being defeated by good old American know-how. And I guess uh, the audiences of the time would have been sitting there going, yes, yay, team for us, because we're always beating the bad guys. And as we've discussed in previous episodes of this show, uh, in a lot of occasions, the aliens featured in alien invasion movies were a representation of the Russian communist threat. So if you're... You know, sort of get your alien from a movie and paint him up as, as, as a Russian and he gets defeated by the Americans. That's a good little fist pump in the air for uh, the home team. So I think there's a lot of that that uh, um, was part of the consideration as well. One of the uh, greatest um, movies describing that is Earth vs. the Flying Saucers because, I mean, they decimate Washington big time and all that. And, and the fact that we come back, you know, it felt very uh, patriotic and sort of, yay, team, we worked out the technology to be able to sort of get their uh, spaceships to wobble and crash. So, uh, you know, none of this sort of uh, microbe germs killing them off. You know, we <laughs> developed the technology. We're, we're uh, gung-ho America. Yeah, you know what? That's actually quite funny because in Earth versus the Flying Saucers, they just turn up and start destroying everything and never explain why they're doing it, what their end game is. It's like, nah, we're just here to take over. You know, people of Earth attention. Um, and a funny thing is, and I agree with you, the War of the Worlds concept uh, is great. You know, not a lot of people probably would have read uh, the original H.G. Wells book. And uh, when the, um, the microbes kill off all the aliens, the audience would have been going, oh, that's awesome. We never would have guessed that. Whereas if you do that movie today, nobody would believe it. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the idea of uh, the good guys winning, which in most cases they do, and the good guys being, say, in this case, the Americans, but not in all cases, uh, using the example of uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers being the first one off the top of my head. Um, there are a couple of movies where the, the good guys don't win, but um, for the most part, I think the intention always was for the audience members to walk out of the uh, cinema and go, that was entertaining, it was fun. And uh, the good guys won and the bad guys lost. So uh, yay team for us. <laughs> it's one of those ones where I'm sure the movie studio doesn't like downbeat endings. So 
certainly the invasion of the body snatchers was the one that sprung to mind for me but I'd be pretty hard to think of any other ones that uh, sort of really fit that description. It wasn't until the 60s, I think that's when they decided that they could use a few downbeat endings, things like uh, the way Planet of the Apes finished. Many of the Twilight Zone television um, stories had that sort of downbeat ending. But in the 50s, good old uh, Yankee know-how and the boys uh, fighting to uh, save freedom were the, the true uh, endings that we were looking for. And, of course, amongst all the alien invasion uh, movies, you had all the monster movies as well. And it's kind of funny because there's varying degrees of, of monsters. Uh, obviously, Ray Harryhausen was very prolific during this time, doing a lot of his films with uh, large monsters running around, destroying cities. There are, <laughs> there are examples where sometimes the monsters weren't as flash as they could have been, like in Them, which had gigantic ants, and they actually used real practical ants for that. And then you got films like Beginning of the End, which was so cheap. They would actually get photographs of buildings, lay them flat, and just get cockroaches to walk over the top of them. And it made them look like, oh, my God, these cockroaches are like seven stories <laughs> high. But, of course, they would walk off the side of the building in the picture, which means they were walking on fresh air. So the idea of large monsters, whatever they happen to be, whether they be real ones or fake ones, um, I mean, that, was, that would have been grouse to see in a cinema. You'd be going, I've never seen gigantic things before just running around doing stuff. And I can imagine at the time a lot of people would have been on the edge of their seats not realising that what they're watching is formulaic. And as a consequence, they'd be thinking, this, this is just great fun. And I guess once we got into the 1970s and people like you and I started watching these movies that were only made 20-something years prior, um, we dialed into that as well. So um, that's for that reason, I think there's a lot of people who can say that the, uh, the 1950s movies... It, it means a lot to them for that very reason, because we can uh, imagine and remember what it was like when we first saw them. And I can sort of give you an idea of the gamut of the good and the bad. So in the good department, we had the id monster from um, Forbidden Planet. And on the opposite spectrum, we had movies like The Giant Claw, which uh, really, uh, it was uh, cheap, but it was funny. But as I said, we really got the gamut so, from those uh, classic movies um, that, like This Island Earth and um, Invaders from Mars to things like, as I said, the Roger Corman movies where it was basically a big lumpy fur thrown over a uh, stunt guy to pretend that they're a monster with big eyes. So some of the classic movies, do you remember first seeing them and your reaction to them, like when you were younger? I mean, there's two that I can think of off the top of my head that I remember seeing on TV and how they impacted me. I would definitely say that most of my um, uh, movies that I watched were sort of the, the, the ones that were considered classic. So, yes, War of the Worlds, Your Forbidden Planet, This Island Earth, um, uh, The Thing, uh so all those ones that I think people will remember most fondly were the ones that tended to get uh, repeated on, uh, on, on television. Uh, but uh, I think I was so hungry that I would have watched anything at that time as a kid. So even the bad ones, I do have some uh, little bit of nostalgia or fondness for. So I can't sort of really say if there's any good or bad ones because I just remember them all so well. Yeah, it's funny because, like, as a kid, I saw two films in particular that really left a lasting impact. One was The Blob, the original Blob, and uh, that gave me nightmares, actually. I was afraid to sleep in bed with my arm hanging out of the side of the bed, uh, thinking The Blob was, <laughs> was going to come up and get me. And the other one was The Thing. And if you've ever watched The Thing, uh, at the very start of the movie or early on in the film after The Thing thaws out, um, uh, he gets attacked by all the dogs and he ends up running out into the snow. And you see him in the distance in the snow and they run out to see what's going on. And they find his arm, the thing's arm has been chewed off by a dog and it's sitting in the snow. And I said, that's it. Got to go to bed. It's scaring, the shit. It's scaring me too much. So, uh, you know, and, and I thought if I had did, that impacted me that way uh, as a kid in the 70s. I can't imagine what it'd be like for audience members in the 50s. But, uh, yeah, there's um, a lot of good material there. And you are right. There are movies which, you know, even by today's standards, you know, probably by when they first came out, you go, oh, that's really corny. That's really cheesy. But you can certainly have a lot of... Uh, respect for the products of the time. And sure, some were better than others. There are some which were pretty terrible. I mean, Attack of the Crab Monsters really isn't much chop. But, hey, we can still remember it today, and that's the most important thing. But there's a lot of them, and there was a lot produced in a very short period of time. So that's what I would say makes the golden era of classic movies so golden in the 1950s because of that reason. 
and they're movies we will go back and enjoy. And even though our kids go, what the heck is that? I mean, uh, if you're of a certain era and a certain age, then, um, as I said, you will uh, enjoy them no matter how uh, old they are. And when you think the 1950s, we're talking about movies that are now scarily 70 years old. Yeah, I know. I, that does sometimes sort of freak me out when I sit and think about that. But you are right. There's still a market for them. It's a small and a shrinking market, but they're out there and uh, people love them. And may they continue to do so. So uh, there you go. That's what our uh, response is regarding the 1950s golden era. If you're not sure, go and check out some classic films from that uh, decade and you'll have a smile on your face in no time at all. So who actually wrote in that particular letter, Mr. Jeffro? Yes, that was actually our... Uh digital photographer, Michael JPEG. <laughs> I actually do like that one. So it's um, time for us to move on to our uh, topic of conversation. It's kind of funny. We were just discussing sort of the good and bad sci-fi movies of the 1950s, and to some degree this sort of rolls into this next topic, but, but not entirely, because what are we discussing tonight, Mr. Jeffro? Yes, we're discussing movies that could be classified as sci-fi movie turkeys. So there's movies that uh, really don't quite sort of seem to have the same appreciation as uh, a lot of classics that we can name, whereas the ones that are uh, turkeys, uh, somewhat forgettable, or otherwise uh, we may not even mention them all because they're that bad. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because off the top of your head, you'd be going, as we just discussed, 1950s movies, oh, a lot of people would say half of those were pretty terrible. And you go, all right, fine, there's that attitude as well. Yeah, sure enough. I mean, one of the classics is of course and plan nine from outer space and your know, robot monsters and whatever else and you go well okay but what about you know films that come out decades after that is it possible to still make a turkey today and the answer is yes and there are really good examples of that films that just didn't work for whatever reason and there would be people out there who have long lists of movies that they go you know what that was just utter rubbish for whatever reason and there's a few that we're probably going to rattle off tonight but uh, how do you want to start this particular discussion, old son? Well, I mean, with uh, these movies, uh, in the 1950s, we would often blame it on the uh, budget. But what we see in more recent times is these movies can have massive budgets but still fail, and, and probably because they spend too much trying to fix something that uh, uh, they really should have uh, started off in the uh, first place is correct. So uh, we have a number of different uh, examples of that where um, you can generally tell that the movie's in trouble when the release date is pushed back. So it's usually uh, when they're either looking at trying to re-edit something that makes the story coherent uh, or the director's looked at it and said, oh, we've missed some plot holes. We need to go back and rewrite it and, and reshoot it. So one of those uh, most famous examples would be the, um, the movie Solo. Uh, as we all know, that got pushed back because there was lots of refilming and, and sort of discussion. And the more the fans actually heard about that, the more dreadful the movie sounded. And I, I don't know whether uh, people convinced themselves it was a terrible movie but when it came out. Certainly that was the, uh, the big reaction. And, and I think maybe some people might have uh, warmed to it a little bit since then and, and, and not been so critical, but certainly at the time... That was a massive failure for the uh, Star Wars franchise. Yeah, I've had uh, multiple discussions with a lot of people regarding uh, what happened with Solo, and most people tend to agree that uh, its marketing was horrendous and it came out at the wrong time. It was six months after The Last Jedi, and even by that point, there was a bit of an anti-Disney sentiment with a lot of Star Wars fans regarding Star Wars movies. Um, but... Uh, ultimately, you are right, the film kind of failed at the box office, but critically, it, it sort of came out okay. And a lot of people thought that um, after the sagas that it went through, so for those who don't know, the original film was being directed by two guys who were comedy directors, and after a few weeks, might have been in a month or two, they, um, the producers, uh, Kathleen Kennedy and Lawrence Kasdan, I think it was, realised that the film was going in the wrong direction. So they sacked the directors and brought in Ron Howard and had to, Ryan had to try and fix it all back up again, which he did, and in the end got the film out. And I think it turned out a lot better than what uh, it could have been. Um, and you can understand it if it hadn't have worked but uh, because of the sagas, but I think it 
kind of came out okay in the end, but as I said, its marketing and timing was pretty horrendous. It should have come out in December of that year instead of May. Um, but there are other movies that come out and you go, well, there's no real excuse for why they're terrible. There, there are indeed. So one of the primary ones, if you look in the past 20 years, now you're thinking, okay, there are some real shockers that did come out in the 80s. And the first one that struck my mind as being, oh, my God, this was horrible, was Time Guardian, which was a classic 80s movie made in Australia, of all things, featured Carrie Fisher and Tom Berlinson. And that was almost like a straight-to-video film that you're thinking, oh, my goodness, how could that be so awful? But uh, I think a lot of people remember that for all the wrong reasons. But in the past 20 years, probably the biggest one, that I think got absolutely canned the most was Battlefield Earth. So based on the old L. Ron Hubbard book um, with John Travolta sort of leading the charge. Now, I didn't think it was as bad as what everybody made it out to be, but if you look at the critical reviews, <laughs> it got bad pretty badly. And you go, well, hang on, if the book was that good and it wasn't a bad book, how did the film turn out so bad? So um, what are your thoughts on that one, dude? I mean, I've read a little bit about uh, Battlefield Earth, and I think it was essentially due to the fact that John Travolta had a lot of uh, power with making this, that uh, essentially when you get an actor that has a lot of say and there's not much else input from anyone else, then things can go um, uh, astray. And, and I think this is what's happened is that uh, he um, wasn't really sort of the person that should be leading this. Uh, because he is a, a Scientologist and, and this is a, a book based on the um, creator of Scientology. So I, I think it was just all the wrong elements sort of um, getting together and, and creating this turkey. Yeah, there's two things that I thought that really worked against Battlefield Earth. One was that uh, John Travolta's character, Turl, um, was meant to be a cyclo. And of course, in the book, the cyclos weren't human at all. Uh, they're obviously alien. And of course, in the film, it was just John Travolta and Forrest Whitaker, like, made taller with extra fingers with long hair and I go that doesn't look alien at all that doesn't work you need to have actual aliens to really sell the, the concept so I think that uh, that certainly didn't work in its favor and of course at the end of the story when uh, our, our heroes who have never seen technology in their entire lives discover a um, an airport hangar full of jet fighters and they just jump on a simulator and learn how to fly airplanes like f-15s or whatever in the space of half an hour and and start bombing the cyclones again yeah, that's not going to work so um but i in, anyway in the end i mean you hear all the bad things about it and i watch it go you know i've seen far worse than this but for whatever reason battlefield earth copped a bit of a hammering and i do agree with you i think had it to do with a lot with the the scientology cloud that was <laughs> hanging over it but uh yeah absolutely unbelievable um so you do some research about films that were terrible and you go there are some you go you know what that probably should never have been made in the first place now this one you can find on youtube even though the quality is horrendous it's obviously like a 15th generation and of course it was the gore movie so it was from the uh you had the books by john norman and of course that one uh got panned pretty badly and of course the issue with the gore series it's very sexist and, of course, that just didn't work for a lot of people. But they did make a film for Gore. And as I said, you can see a really bad copy of it on YouTube. Uh, I've that never actually sat through it. But I can understand why it would not be very popular. And, of course, it got uh, critically bad pretty badly. So that's another example that's out there. Now that I've said it, people are probably going to run out and have a look at it. Check it out. Make up your own mind. <laughs> uh, you've got some other ones you want to bring up. Yeah. I had a look online just to see what everyone else's opinions on. Uh, and I found some that I... I looked at it and said, oh, of course, these are ones that uh, have been universally panned. Now, one of the ones that I remember watching, but I've, I've completely blanked it out of my head, is a movie called Ballistic X versus Sever. And that was voted uh, a movie so bad, it was described as ex as exciting as a screensaver, maybe a little <laughs> bit less. I mean, what a pan that is. And... Um, one of the other movies that um, I watched because it was so bad, just to remind myself how bad it was, was The Adventures of Pluto Nash. And that was an Eddie Murphy uh, uh, vehicle. And a little bit like we described before, this was, of course, driven by him because he's got star power and he wanted to sort of do it his way. And basically, um, in these situations, when uh, the budget goes out of control, the, the actor is uh, going out of control, you, you get train wrecks like this. 
So, I mean, there are some films that obviously became cult hits because they were a bit on the poor side. I mean, we've uh, sort of mentioned earlier on in this discussion about the Roger Corman movies and of course he produced galaxy of terror i think it was in 1980 or thereabouts and um it's one of those movies you go wow that's really really terrible but we love it because it's terrible and there are others you know like galaxina was another one and they're 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 painful to sit through but you can kind of get it you go you know it's a product of its time and it kind of works and it's kind of funny how something that is inverted commas bad can still work for people and they can look upon these things with great affection and you kind of get it so as we mentioned right at the top of the discussion with plan nine from outer space where you know, voted as one of the like the worst movie ever made and it's not by any stretch it's there there are the, when it would made it it really was thinking it was going to be a fantastic movie and it's great entertainment i mean it's very low budget and you can see that but it's by no means like terrible um you know if you want to see a good example of low budget films that aren't maybe that much chop i mean you go to the trauma catalog for that and there would be movies that once upon a time would have been straight to video that have been independently made and unfortunately uh there are examples where just because something is independently made it can still be quite poor because they cut corners either in the story or the casting or its production design you can make relatively good films with good stories uh on a very low budget but i think what happens in some cases they try and do too much and as a consequence it just doesn't work and there are plenty of examples where that occurs i remember uh when mad max came out there was a plethora of different uh copies and to watch through all of those and there are so many you just realize that uh you can't get much better than the original and i mean they're laughable and some of them are uh in a good way laughable but there's just so many of these things are just turkeys and um, just cash-ins is really what they are, just cash-ins. And, and people watch them because they think, oh, I love Mad Max, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check this one out. And, you know, they don't enjoy it, but at least they got the money from them. So it's, uh, that's what they're after. Yeah, exactly right. So one of the things that I did want to bring up, and this sort of fits right into this particular discussion, there was a filmmaker, nobody has heard of him. Uh, you may have because you're pretty well dialed into a lot of this bit of history. He was a filmmaker called Donald G. Jackson. And his uh, claim to fame, and I use that in inverted commas because nobody's ever heard of him before, uh, was that he was making films when the video revolution hit in the 1980s. And he had realised that post-apocalyptic films were the way to go because it gave you a blank canvas to work with. So you didn't have to worry about your production design and all your fancy sets and whatever else because you could have whatever world you wanted. And he was an independent filmmaker who fi had to finance a lot of his own movies and produced a lot of them. And as a consequence, he churned out a lot of stuff that most people have never seen before. And if you've ever heard of the movie Rollerblade 7, that was actually one of his um, big um, concepts. And, of course, that was before the term Rollerblade actually existed. Um, he finally did get one of his films made uh, as a big budget or budgeted movie. That was Hell Comes to Frogtown. And that was his claim to fame. But he had a lot of issues regarding the control uh, over that because the studio that he was working for kept interfering with his processes now the funny thing about donald g jackson is that he did a lot of his films are all post-apocalyptic you cannot find them anywhere he himself passed away 20 years ago uh, but anybody wants to look up who he was and what he did there's a really good interview with him uh, that was done by a french magazine 20 something years ago and it's really long, it's really insightful, but it's all about his history regarding filmmaking and uh, and the fact that he was shooting on film and how expensive that was. And his focus was all post-apocalyptic, if you want, sci-fi movies. The problem is a lot of them aren't that good. They're very independent, they're very personal. You could almost call him an, an auteur of, of sorts, but his material just went nowhere. And uh, with that in mind, do you actually know who I'm talking about, Donald G. Jackson? I knew the name, but if you had to tell me uh, what movie it was, I, I couldn't have said that until you mentioned Hell Come to Frogtown, which is, of course, the Rowdy Roddy uh, Piper vehicle that uh, has a little bit of a, a cult uh, status to it. So that uh, at least I did know. 
Yeah, it's funny because I've seen Hell Comes to Frogtown and it's like it didn't really work for me. It just it's a good <laughs> a good bad movie if that's the case. And I've got to admit, I don't really have a lot of time for films that are don't really cut the mustard. And unfortunately, um, even that was a good one. But uh, so yeah, if you're interested in seeing independent uh, sci-fi movies that really were kind of heading in the more the turkey direction, um, best luck trying to find them. But uh, Donald G. Jackson, as I said, most people don't even know who he was, and he churned out a lot, a lot of stuff. Yeah, and then on the uh, opposite end, you've got the movies that are very expensive that actually uh, turn out to be uh, turkeys because I was looking at some of the other uh, uh, main examples that people have nominated and uh, their budgets are quite considerable. And uh, one of the boring movies of all time, in my opinion, uh, is the Will Smith movie After Earth that came out in 2013. And what a snooze fest that was. <laughs> and I, I haven't seen it, but I heard all about it. People said it was not a shocker. And I was like, well, what went wrong, dude? What went wrong? He employed his son to be in it. That's pretty crap to begin with. And it just, it is ponderous. There's no pace to it other than the, the pace of a geriatric person and trying to crawl along in a wheelchair. It's that slow. It's very funny. Some movies can be so bad that they actually got a, a bit of a reputation, and sometimes that can work for them because people say, "Well, I've heard all this negative uh, feedback. I want to go and check it out for myself." And it's a question as to whether you get to the end of these things and go, "Yeah, all the critics were right," or you can say, "Well, hang on, I think it was a little bit harsh." Um, and, and the funny thing is, just getting—I know we're sort of repeating ourselves. The Plan Nine scenario, Plan Nine from Outer Space, and of course. For those who saw the movie Ed Wood, so Ed Wood made Plan 9 from Outer Space and it went nowhere. It just died in the ass, effectively, for years and years and years. Then it was not until the 1970s some film critics uh, looked at it and said, oh, it's the worst movie ever made. And, of course, what happened? Everybody went and saw <laughs> and saw it and then it became a more a popular film after that so ed wood finally found the fame but of course he'd passed away like 10 years prior or thereabouts so um so sometimes bad movies can get a, a, an audience purely because of the fact that they've got a bit of a reputation i think the shark nato movies are similar to that so bad they're good scenario but there are movies that are just so bad they're just bad <laughs> and nothing changes that and uh, the reputation can actually work against them we do have some classic examples of that. So uh, one of the ones that I know that uh, will hit you is uh, Howard the Duck. I mean, it's mm. so bad that people actually want to see it just to see how bad it is. And uh, another one that has uh, a real reputation as being so bad that, uh, again, you have to see it just to see whether people are actually making this up or not is Highlander 2, The Quickening. It, oh, yes. uh, it's just a real uh, turkey compared to the first one. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Like when you start with Howard the Duck, the thing about Howard the Duck, that was a bit of a budgeted movie, had a bit of money associated with it. George Lucas produced it and everybody sort of pointed the finger at him for saying it was terrible. And, of course, he had nothing to do with the creative side of it. Um, I mean, just the name of it kind of doesn't work. They're going to make a movie about a duck and it's clearly not a real duck. It's an animatronic one and you go, or a puppet or whatever, and you go, you know what, that just sounds dumb. And I know a couple of people who saw it who enjoyed it for what it was. But realistically, I mean, what are the chances that was going to work? Uh, nah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, and I do know a lot of Highlander fans who go, yeah, when it comes to Highlander 2, they just ignore it. They just pretend it didn't happen. But the thing is, fans, it did happen for whatever reason. I feel that same way with Alien 3. It's like, was there an Alien 3? It's like, you know, 1, 2 and 4. What happened to 3? Well, in my mind, I blanked it out. It's that bad for me. In the future, there's one that I'm just really dreading is going to be an awful turkey, and I really hope it isn't because the first movie was so fantastic, and that's Aquaman 2. I mean, that was actually promised years ago, but uh, COVID got in the way, and then after COVID uh, uh, finished, they were promising to put it in the cinemas, and next thing you know, they're removing actresses out of the movie, and they're talking about recutting it, and the leading man is sort of... Uh, uh, been rumoured to be a, uh, a monger on the set. So all these rumours and, 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 and delays and all that. So if we're going to have a, a future turkey, Aquaman 2 could potentially be it, and I'm hoping that uh, it isn't. But uh, let's see how that goes. Yeah, using the solo example we had earlier on where it could have turned out to be a complete train wreck, they kind of salvaged it. But in this case, they are making so many changes and it seems to be going through so many sagas. 
you wish them all the best, but uh, I tend to agree with you. If you want a really dodgy movie to see, uh, and this one I've got to admit did sort of spin me out a little bit. This is a, a 1950s or 60s production. You can't go past, and just the title alone should be enough for you to dig it up, The Wild Women of Wongo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you haven't not doing anything on a Saturday night, check that out. You'll find it somewhere. What do you reckon, Jeffo? It's one of those movies that's a very popular title with the Mystery Science Theatre crowd. So there's a, a whole bunch of these movies that uh, you can uh, watch with them doing the commentary that are, are really bad movies when you watch them by themselves. But when you get their comments over it, it makes it very palatable. Yeah, I've got a friend of ours, our mate uh, Russell Devlin, used, uh, used the term, oh, it's not exactly a Wongo movie. It was a classification of film as far as he was concerned. So like, what was the film like, Russell? Uh, it wasn't exactly a Wongo movie, which means it wasn't that bad. <laughs> Wild Women of Wongo. Check it out if you haven't done so already. So, of course, to do that, you've got to get away from us, which means that it's our time to buzz off. Uh, any final words before we shove off for this evening, Mr. Jeffro? Yeah, I'd like to say that uh, there are lots of bad movies out there, so check them out just so you can hate me. And as always, make sure you stay nerdy. Stay nerdy. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da